So I'm inherently good. No matter where I've fallen, goodness lives in me. No matter how much I've given up, goodness hasn't given up on me, right? Goodness lives in me. Goodness calls me. And actually, I don't feel alive. I don't feel good, right? I don't feel like I'm realizing my life unless I'm engaged to realize that goodness. And I want to realize it through effort. I want to sacrifice for it. I want to be in that great heroic journey towards my own self-transformation so I can step into my unique expression of goodness, which is my unique self. Let's see if we can find this. Let's get our code. Let's find our code, okay? So David, thank you for the code. People are not, let's find it. People are not naturally good. Whoa, right? Does everyone get that? Does that like, does that shake us up a little bit? People are not naturally good. The belief that people are naturally good, right? Is how, what, right? Like, oh my God, right? The belief that people are naturally good is wrong and dangerous. People are inherently good. Belief that people are not inherently good is wrong and dangerous. So, you know, I want to just say something about this for a second before we get started. I was talking to my beloved friend and colleague, the great teacher of Kashmir Shaivism, Sally Kempton. And, you know, Sally said, wow, you know, you know, I just shared this with her um, a couple of nights ago. And she's like, wow. So that actually, that resolves issues I've been thinking about for for 30 years. So I just want to share with you, right? And just, you know, from my my heart to your heart and, you know, my, my, you know, sicky chills that I'm having right now, you know, to whenever you've been sick, right? This formulation, right? This formulation I've thought about for 20 years. And this formulation is a what I would call a second simplicity, okay? A second simplicity, and and I'm going to go for for Derek. I'm going to go. Derek says innately good. I get the word. Let's let's stick with the. If that's okay, brother, I'm just going to stay with one word. Inherently good, but innately is close. But but this code is what we call second simplicity, meaning meaning after wrestling with life for decades, right, and with you know a thousand texts. Right, texts of real life and, and sacred texts, right? Right. I came to this formulation and it, it's, it's, it's good, right? It's good. Not in the sense of like, I did a good thing, but more like it, 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 it captures a lot and it's wildly important. Okay. So let me see if I can try and, and we're going to do two, two one mountains on this, this one in and one more. And I want to just, and if I can, Right, just because I'm a little bit a little bit sick today, I want to just just I want to just like do like a, a fireside chat with you. Can we do that? Can we be in fireside chat mode? Is that okay? Is that okay, everybody? Okay. So here's fireside chat mode. Why is the belief that we're naturally good wrong and dangerous? Okay, why why is that wrong and dangerous? And what do we mean by good? And what does naturally good mean? So let, let's start with babies. Are babies good? No. I've never met a good baby in my life. Right? Never. I love babies. I'm mad. I mean, how can you not be in love with babies? A baby walks into the room and right, the whole room gets turned upside down. We love babies. But babies are not good. I've never met a good baby in my life ever. There are no good babies. So I want to get that really clear. There are no good babies any place in the world, right? Or let me say differently, there's no naturally good babies, okay? Babies are cute. They're not good, right? They're not naturally good in that sense, right? So or we say it differently. Babies are inherently good. They're not naturally good. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that, that, that a baby hasn't chosen goodness. A baby hasn't practiced. A baby hasn't trained. Right? And goodness has to be trained. Right? You never get goodness if you don't train it. And if we don't train goodness, 
we devolve right to our lowest common denominator and the lowest common denominator goes cruel i've met many 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 kids who behave cruelly right and cruel kids become cruel adults and lots of adults have a, a deep cruel streak in them and that cruel streak expresses itself it can express itself in an argument right moments that we don't want televised it can express itself in a kind of contraction right and a shutting off to the larger world and there's a thousand ways cruelty expresses itself but the core of it is in order to become good right you have to there's no way to become good without in some super serious way training goodness okay you have to train goodness now training goodness is not about making up a set of ideas and then conditioning people to those ideas that's called conditioning that's not training training means i know goodness is real and then i train right in order to realize that which lives inside of me okay let me give you a simple analogy okay that's a good analogy we're inherently right inherently we have bodies okay in order to make our bodies strong we have to train our bodies right it's almost never will you see right a body right, that's super strong super balanced super right well developed but in a beautiful sense not in a, an obnoxious sense in a beautiful elegant sense right that hasn't gone through some level of training some level of practice right we we might have you know in a different realm right we might naturally right we right we we naturally what's a good example right we naturally fall in love right everybody falls in love but to stay in love is not natural and so there's a biological movement towards falling in love there's an existential movement towards falling in love we don't stay in love naturally no one stays in love naturally staying in love which is what love is about takes training it takes enormous training enormous discipline to actually hold love to stay in love right to be a billion times more in love 10 years later than you were in the first two months so it's a very very powerful idea right the idea is that love lives inside of us that's absolutely true love lives inside us that's true love lives inside us it's in us there'll be moments when it's activated an explosion right falling in love nature doing its thing but then that disappears it gives us a glimpse of what's possible then it's gone and then actually to be outrageous lovers i've got to train right it's all a huge training to be an outrageous lover and at the core of outrageous lover is goodness unique expressions of goodness unique expressions of kindness right but i've got to train for those if i don't train for them they don't exist they disappear not only do they disappear but i devolve towards my lowest common denominator as a human being right right and and i get I get, you know, I get sloppy. I get slovenly, right? I get, remember that novel by, uh, what was it called? William Golding, right? Called The Lord of the Flies and about the kids alone together on the island. And what happens? These, these beautiful children devolve to cruelty. Now, stay, stay close, okay? So why is this belief in our code? Why is this belief kind of wildly dangerous? Because if I don't actually understand that, stay close, I'm inherently good, goodness lives in me, but I'm not naturally good, I've got to train goodness, right? Then I don't actually engage in the process of training, right? I don't actually understand that in order to become good, I've got to train. 
So whenever something goes wrong, whether I do something wrong or something goes wrong in my community, right? It can't be me because I'm naturally good, right? I don't get the distinction between naturally good and inherently good. So if something goes wrong, what do I do? I blame it always in outside forces. That's number one, right? If I actually believe that people are naturally good, then if goodness is not happening, I say, can't be me, must be outside forces. And then we argue, what are the outside forces? Is it, you know, problems in these kind of laws? Is it the conservatives? That's the problem. It's the liberals. That's the problem, right? It's, you know, it's gun control laws. That's the problem, right? Right. It's right. It's, it's right. Whatever it is, we pick a problem in society. Now that problem might be a real problem, but we make that problem, whether it's parents, it's schools, it's pornography, it's television violence. Now, all right, all of those things may need addressing. But what we do is we make something outside of ourselves the cause of evil. But actually, right, the human being can devolve to evil. Right? That's actually true. Right? And evil happens in many forms. Evil is not just Hitler. Evil is when I shut my eyes to suffering. Right? Right. Claire sent me something incredible on Friday, which we read, right? This incredible piece just about what's going on in, in, in certain parts of the world, right? It's evil when I close my eyes to suffering, right? It's evil when, right, I don't speak out against injustice. It's evil when I take away my unique gift when it's uniquely needed, right, in order to change the world, right? There's lots of ways, right? Evil's the opposite of live, right? Evil's not a pernicious devil. Evil's when I'm, I'm, I'm not standing for life. Evils live spelled backwards, okay? So the, the first reason that this belief is, is fundamentally dangerous, the belief that people are naturally good, is that what happens is I basically say the problem is outside, right? Two is, right, if basically, if basically people are naturally good and there's an outside problem, so people are no longer morally accountable and we need accountability, if there's no accountability, it means you don't count. You have no dignity. You don't matter, right? So what we've done is we've replaced good and evil with sick and healthy. Does everyone get that? We've created what, what Christina Hoff Summers calls a therapeutic culture. No one's ever morally accountable. There's never good and evil. There's only sick and healthy. Now, I want to stay clear. I want to be really close here. I want to be really careful here, right? Let's say in the 50s, around the world, everything was about good and evil, and no one got that it was actually sickness. Sometimes there, was, there, were, there, were, there were real issues of sickness that needed to be worked with, and everyone was made about this kind of pure moral good and evil. And we didn't get trauma. We didn't get, right, sickness and health, right? So that was important. So we then moved beyond that, and we actually incorporated models of sickness and health. But then we left good and evil behind. Right. We need to now go to level three. We, yes, we get sickness and health. That's important. Right. The, the varieties of therapy are important. And then we need to move to level three and should we reclaim moral accountability and moral accountability means it doesn't mean that if someone makes a mistake, we, we, we cancel them. It means that if you make a mistake, you take responsibility for it in the best way you can and you commit to transform and then you move on. Right. But but, but there's res responsibility it doesn't mean cancellation it doesn't mean shame. It means that I take responsibility for, for my missteps in the best way that I know how. And that's, that's what makes a person who's great. A person can actually take responsibility and transform. And we love each other even more. Right? But we take responsibility. We don't, we don't engage in a denial of evil in which we basically say, right, you know, we're naturally good and, and evil's just sick. We don't reduce it to a therapeutic culture. Did everyone got that? It's very deep. That's two, right? Three, three. This is the third reason why the belief that people are naturally good is the most dangerous belief in the world, right? The third reason is, is that if we believe people are naturally good, there's no reason to train goodness. And that's how we created, for example, I'll just give you one example, and it's true in, in Europe as well, in many places, it's certainly true in the United States. In the United States, the public schools do you know, what's largely a values-free education, right? I was able to go to, right, to Bronx High School of Science in New York or to Exeter Academy and talk to the kids, is there intrinsic, intrinsic good in the world, intrinsic obligation to do good, or is it just your option, it's your decision? And 99% of the kids said there's no intrinsic obligation to do good. 
That's why Mark Zuckerberg was educated at Exeter. It's a big deal. Okay. So in other words, if we believe that we're naturally good, why would you train for goodness? And if we believe that we're naturally good, we can actually justify, right? A school system, which there's no education for goodness. So the entire school system is just about skills, right? And we've completely split between, let's say, the STEM professions and the humanities. And the humanities themselves are based on a kind of disqualification of value, right? We, 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 we're interested in the aesthetic, but we don't actually understand the good. Okay, so that's three. Four, right? If we're naturally good, so if there's a problem with our goodness, it means there's it's from forces that are outside of us, then essentially, right, we don't need to change our inner values, right? We, we don't need to engage in a process of transformation of our values. We don't need to up-level our values. We don't need to evolve our values. We don't need to be involved in that conversation at all because the problem is outside. It's so what I got to do is I've got to fix society. Now, we clearly believe that fixing society is unbelievably important. That's for sure. That's hugely important. Of course it is. It's not a binary choice. But what happens is we focus our energy on the fixing of society and not on the fixing of ourselves. The fixing of ourselves is not an issue. Instead of fixing ourselves, we actually get self-indulgently obsessed with our own interior right, mood experience. And then we go to therapist after therapist to talk about it. Right? And as we reduce right, our moral responsibility to a therapeutic experience, does everyone get that? And so we don't engage in the process of self-transformation, which is the major process of human being. You cannot trust a human being who's not engaged in a process of self-transformation, who's not engaged in tikkun. That's number four. And finally, number five, right? right. If we think people are naturally good, then the basic struggle is between the human being and society and not between the human being and herself, the human being and himself. Right? We actually abandon right, the tension of the great struggle within ourselves, right? Now, if you abandon that tension and you abandon that struggle, right, you'll never be a gorgeous human being right? because people are not naturally gorgeous. People train to be gorgeous. It's wild. Does everyone get that? I mean, this is a huge conversation. It's a huge conversation, right? All of life is about training goodness. I don't become, I, I don't become unique self. I don't become homo amor without engaging in a constant gorgeous process of weightlifting, right? I'm training. And the delight of my life is to engage in that process of training. Now, last piece, the reason the training works, the reason it's so ecstatic, the reason that our training is animated by kind of ecstatic urgency and by a joy is because although we're not naturally good, we're inherently good, right? We participate in goodness. Goodness is our deeper nature. And here I want to make a distinction. We'll close in a second. Right? I want to distinguish between my surface nature and my deeper nature, right? Right? You know, there's a, there's a beautiful song, Amazing Grace, right? And Amazing Grace, right, talks about, you know, I was lost and now I'm found, right? And he talks about it. This happened. It's a Christian song, so it's about being found, you know, in this particular tradition by the Christ. But his point is, he's got to do something in order to be found. He's got to believe. Now, in the Christian tradition, right? What it, what believing means is, right? Is not a dogmatic belief. The deeper teaching of belief is, I got to believe in reality. I got to believe in myself. I've got to step forward. But, but we actually have to take that amazing grace song. We've got to deepen it. It means I was lost and then I trained and then I worked and then I struggled and now I'm found, right? I've got to be my own Messiah. And I got to know that that Messiah lives in me and that amazing grace lives in me because I'm inherently good. And goodness is godness. 
Taste and hear. Tamur u kitova adonai. Taste and see that God is good. Godness and goodness are, are the same. And they're, not, they're not just a, 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 an etymological accident, right? So I'm inherently good. No matter where I've fallen, goodness lives in me. No matter how much I've given up, goodness hasn't given up on me. Right? Goodness lives in me. Goodness calls me. And actually, I don't feel alive. I don't feel good. Right? I don't feel like I'm realizing my life unless I'm engaged to realize that goodness. And I want to realize it through effort. I want to sacrifice for it. I want to be in that great heroic journey towards my own self-transformation so I can step into my unique expression of goodness, which is my unique self, right? Like, wow, that's goodness. I'm inherently good, right? That's huge, right? I am goodness. That's why, that's why what we call anthroontology works, meaning the reason I can know ethics from my own clarified interiors because my own clarified interiors are good. So last distinction. So my surface nature, right, right? At my surface nature, I'm not naturally good. Okay, got that? But there's this distinction I want to make between what I want to call my first nature or my surface nature and my deeper nature, my second nature. Surface nature and depth nature. I'm not naturally good at the level of my surface nature. But at the level of my depth nature, my deeper nature, well, there, there I'm, I'm inherently good. Right? I'm like, I'm totally good. I am only goodness, which is why I'm aesthetically, right, existentially, psychologically devastated when I'm not living the fullness of my goodness. My goodness never gives up on me, even if I gave up on my goodness. So, wow. So, the surface belief that dominates right? The communities of the mainstream media, right? Much of the liberal communities, right? Right. Which says I'm naturally good, huge mistake, single most dangerous belief in the world for all the reasons we enumerated. But the conservative teaching that says, wow, they, they say, they always cite the verse. The verse is for the heart of the human being is evil from his youth. And, and they say, no, no, the person's not naturally good. And then they give a big talk about that. No, no, Yes, the person's not naturally good. The person's inherently good. We're all inherently good. We're all inherently good uniquely. Right? Like, oh my God, let's get this. Let's get this really deeply. So I'm not naturally good. Right? I'm inherently good. Number one. Number two, my goodness needs to be trained. Okay? Right? And my goodness is, is it's really simple. Right? You don't need to define goodness. We know what goodness is. I mean, there's, there's lots of, right, right, we're going to talk a lot about first values and first principles that constitute goodness. But goodness means I behave in a good way that's kind, that's loving, right, that breaks my narcissism, that supports, that's devotional, right, that is, right, that's creating better space between me, more love, more kindness, more goodness, more truth, more beauty, right? So again, let's get it clear. I'm not naturally good. That's the most dangerous belief in the world for the five reasons we outlined, number one. Number two, I'm inherently good. Like, wow, I'm inherently good, right? I might give up on my goodness, my goodness never gives up on me. Two, three, how do I activate my inherent goodness? Three, four, by training, right? Life is a great training in goodness. Where does the battle between good and evil take place? Inside of me, number five, always, right? I'm madly committed to my own self-transformation, which is my own self-transformation to my own highest goodness, right? I was lost, now I'm found, amazing grace. It's that transformation. That's the essence of human being.